Well, I own less Bitcoin and more Ethereum. So basically still 100% of my liquid net worth is in crypto. And I know everybody always asks the split. It's currently 55% Ethereum, which is going up every day because Ethereum is outperforming, which I know some people don't like to hear. Twenty-five percent Bitcoin and a kind of tail of an equally weighted basket of, of um, other protocols and tokens, plus a bit more of a concentrated bet in community tokens um, and uh, NFT side of stuff. And Bitcoin, with the rest of the crypto space, is kind of the same because they're like, but we had the perfect thing. So Real Vision, we started itself to de democratize the very best financial intelligence. And part of that journey is I knew crypto was going to be part of this whole thing, part of macro, part of finance. So we covered it a lot, but thus the ethos of the space tends to be free when it comes to this kind of information. And I thought, how can we educate as many people as possible? The sp space tends to be a bit siloed. People focus on certain aspects and we wanted to have that broad, deep, you know, here's the full interview about the protocol and here's three follow-up interviews about it. You know, here's how this is all working. Here are the players, here are the institutions. Give everybody a much broader space. Well, I own less Bitcoin and more Ethereum. So basically still 100% of my liquid net worth is in crypto. And I know everybody always asks the split. It's currently 55% Ethereum, which is going up every day because Ethereum's outperforming, which I know some people don't like to hear. 25% um, Bitcoin and a kind of tail of, an equally weighted basket of, of um, other protocols and tokens, plus a bit more of a concentrated bet in community tokens um, and uh, NFT side of stuff. Firstly, I saw the vitriol of the Bitcoin community when I, in October, started saying the ETH chart looks pretty interesting and ETH Bitcoin chart looks interesting. People were angry they hunted me down online you know and i was like huh that always makes me if somebody says i'm an idiot for looking at something it makes me want to look at it um so i started doing work on it and the assumption was from the bitcoin community was bitcoin was special it was the only one and it was driven by store of value and everything else was a shitcoin. And basically, I looked at Ethereum, looked at the on-chain data, and realized that, okay, we've just gone through the EIP 1559, so that's burning ETH. Then I looked at, okay, on-chain, what's going on? Well, there was a huge amount that had been taken off exchange, an enormous amount that had been staked for ETH 2.0. There's a massive amount that was also in DeFi locked away, and that left 13% of the entire supply available on exchange. So the supply is falling every day. It's probably about 11% now. And yet demand was exponential. So if you've got exponential demand and limited supply, you're going to get an exponential rise in price. I looked at this and said, not until ETH 2.0 comes out, is this going to change? Because everybody's going to stake. Because there's no point not staking until that, that moment, right? Because the ETH price is going to rise. So everyone's incentivized to stake or to take it off exchange and there's no supply and it's going to keep falling and they're burning ETH. If you notice online, this is happening everywhere. It's it's anti-Tesla, anti-ARC, anti-EV in generally, anti-climate change, anti-vax, anti-crypto, Bitcoin people don't like Ethereum, right? There's, there's this weird split. When you step back and say, what what is going on here? There is one narrative that ties it all together. It's the fear of change. We're going through the fastest period of change of all human history. And it's hard for people. And they want to know what they know. And they can't deal with all of this change happening. I think it's going to be reasonable. And I think the battle that happened a couple of weeks ago or last week, I can't remember. Everything happens in like a whole year happens in a week in crypto. But that showed that there is a huge bunch of young voters who will not get pushed around and that people want change. Younger people want change and the older people fear change. I get it, that's normal. But in the end, somebody carries more votes and it's gonna be the young people um, because of the millennial and, and Gen Z combined with us Gen Xers in the middle, um, 
you know, we carry the swing boat now, not the baby boomers. So I, I do think it changes and I think they become reasonable. They will occasionally try heavy handed ta tactics. Um, and we should expect that, you know, anybody in this space understands what roadblocks get put up. They eventually get taken down mainly. You know, how many times has China banned Bitcoin or crypto? You know, it's like every cycle. Yeah. If the, if the whole of the of the whole of government is debating cryptocurrency, it's over. It's been, you know, that battle has been won. There is no, is this for real or not? Is this going to last? Are we going to make it? Of course we're going to make it. It now depends how fast. I don't know. I think somebody somewhere said, we need to raise more tax. How do yeah. we do that? Let's stiff it to crypto. Yeah, let's do that. And then worded it poorly. Then an entire shit fight blows up and they're like, <sighs> you know, if they just thought about it better, a lot of the crypto leaders were like, nobody minds better tax collection on crypto, but just don't screw up the whole system by randomly naming participants or not naming participants right, and yeah. implying that they all have to pay on something that they have no control over. It's ridiculous. You know, for institutions to go, oh, well, we're going to buy Bitcoin. Okay. How do you mark to market it? What is the open? What is the close? Which price do you take? There's no single exchange. Then how do you custody it? How do you account for it? All of this stuff takes months of work. For institutions, it's a function of what I talked about. It just takes time. Right? There's a lot of people to get across the line and you need to appease a lot of people. For the corporations, it's how you account for it in gap accounting. This is the big problem, is you can only mark it down, you can't mark it up, and it has volatility in your quarterly earnings. So only people like Michael Saylor will accept it, others won't. So everyone's trying to figure out, can we get gap accounting rules changed? Or if not, is there a vehicle that will um, be able to allow us to do it without putting it on the balance sheet is a way of having it off balance sheet. So that's why the corporations are slow. It's, they want to do it. I've spoken to many, but they're like, these accounting rules, we don't know what to do. And Bitcoin with the rest of the crypto space is kind of the same because they're like, but we had the perfect thing. And, then, and as you say, yeah, but there's different perfect things for different outcomes. And in fact, everything, nothing is perfect here. But there's a bunch of use cases for a bunch of different things, and that's okay. It doesn't stop Bitcoin being amazing. It doesn't stop gold being amazing. And it doesn't stop a Ferrari petrol engine being amazing. That's okay. They can all exist. But the world is changing, whether you like it or not. Because Bitcoin was special. It was the only one. And it was driven by store of value. So everyone's incentivized to stake or to take it off exchange and there's no supply and it's going to keep falling. They want to know what they know and they can't deal with all of this change happening. The whole of government is debating cryptocurrency. It's over. It's been, you know, that battle has been won.